My name is Kyle Meyerd-Skop. I'm the Vice President of the Evangelical Environmental Network. And I want to talk today about Revelation 21 because I love Revelation 21. In it, John the Revelator is pulling back the curtain and giving his first century Jewish audience suffering under Roman rule a lifeline. Though you are suffering now, says John, just look at what God has in store. And what exactly does God have in store? What, what is the hope that John holds out, both to his first century Jewish audience and to us today? Well, the hope is this, that God's final culminating act of salvation will be to join heaven and earth, God's space and our space, once and for all. And he will do so not by sucking up disembodied human souls into an ethereal heaven where we'll float on clouds and sprout wings and play harps, which actually sounds a lot more like Greek philosophy than Jewish theology, a lot more Plato than John the Revelator. Instead, God will come to us just as he's been doing from the very beginning, just as he did in the garden, in a burning bush, in a pillar of cloud and fire, in the tabernacle, in the temple, in Jesus. How do we know that this is the final plan? Well, because of what John sees. He sees a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to earth. Jerusalem, remember, was the, the city of God's holy temple, the dwelling place of God's very presence on earth. At the time John penned his revelation, the temple in Jerusalem lay in ruins. It was razed to the ground by Roman occupying forces, maybe only a decade before John put pen to paper. The trauma of this event for first century Jews is impossible to overstate. By seeing the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven to earth, John is effectively saying, I saw God's presence. God himself will come back, and this time, he will never leave us again. But what about that word, new? Doesn't it prove that this world is passing away and God will start over? Well, not if you take the Greek seriously. In the original Greek in which Revelation is written, there are two words for new. There's neos, which is brand new, never before seen, straight out of the box, from scratch, new. And there's kainos, which means renewed, restored, taking that which is and bringing it to its fullest intended purpose and potential. Any guesses? which Greek word Revelation 21 uses for new? Yeah, it's, it's kainos. It's kainos every single time. In other words, John is saying that God's not starting over. God's restoring his masterpiece. God is in the business of making all things new, not making all new things. All things, says John, have a destiny, a place in God's coming good future. And by living like we believe this is true, we participate in and bear witness to this coming good future, however imperfectly. By working to stop pollution, to preserve biodiversity, to slow climate change, we join our voice with that emanating from the throne. We proclaim that this world matters, that God has a good future for it, and that even now, God is making everything new. So what hope can we take from this today? Our world is beset by crises. Economic, public health, democratic, ecological, racial, mental health, the crises seem to go on and on. Well, John's original audience knew crisis too. Yet the beautiful truth that he held out to them 
and that he holds out to us today is that even though the headlines scream otherwise, the future of God's world is secure and his purposes will be accomplished. But if you think that this means that we're off the hook and free to put our feet up until God's ultimate purposes are realized, think again. Jesus was clear what our task is as we await God's coming good future. And Paul and other New Testament writers are too. Our task as we wait for heaven and earth to be united in perfect justice, mercy, and fulfillment and delight is to live now by the power of the Holy Spirit as if it's already here. To live lives marked by joy and delight to demand from our leaders justice and mercy, to model lives of contentment and fulfillment, to live as if God's tomorrow is today. Not because we believe that by doing so, we can somehow bring God's coming future faster, but because by living like we believe the story of God's good purposes for the world, we are being faithful. We get better through fits and starts and stumbles at loving God, loving God's world and loving our neighbors. We get better at following Jesus. So friends, as the storms of 2020 and 21 rage around us, we have this treasure in jars of clay the bone-deep trust and overwhelming hope that our efforts to love God, to love God's world, to love our neighbors by addressing climate change and pollution, that matters. That in the economy of God's certain good future, every act of faithful resistance is a down payment on a future where resistance will no longer be necessary. Every prophetic act and every prophetic call to action is an investment in a future where prophets will rest their voices at last. When God will be all in all and the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. This future is coming. Of this we can be sure. May this hope give us the strength we need to live as though it's already here. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.